Get in on the action and make your bet with Sports Interaction. The F1 schedule is heating up. Will you go with the O, Reliable, and Max Verstappen? Or take your chance with a potential surprise. Download the app in Ontario. Use the QR code you see at the bottom of your screen somewhere. Or head to sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn to get started. 19 plus, please play responsibly. Welcome to Nailing the Apex, everyone. I'm Tim Haraney. Please head on over to Spotify. Give us a five-star rating and a follow. Same goes with Apple Podcasts as well. Write reviews. It really helps us grow the show. You can follow me on social media at Tim Haraney. Happy Pride Month, everyone. Kicking off a few initiatives at SDPN this June as we've teamed up with the Get Real Movement. So the guys from SDP are going to strap on their running shoes on June 23rd, take part in the virtual 5K run to raise money for the Rainbow Railroad. Uh, I may try and join them as well for the run, but joining me on the show, who could talk about this a little bit more, from uh, SDPN, it's Jesse Blake. Dude, what's happening? How are you? Uh, I'm good, and I don't want to hear try. I want to see you out there running that 5K right. with us. All right, I'll yeah, be there. No. <laughs> we, we don't know what goofy stunt we're going to do. We might be in <laughs> costumes. But we don't expect that out of you. You can just get the running shoes and, and help us with the 5K. If it's, like, really hot and you guys want to, like, dress up in banana suits or something, man, whew, I'm, I'm out on that one. I'm just going to No, run. you're not in for that? <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know how hot that's going to be? I mean, pass out from dehydration. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if it's, like, 30 degrees, we might pull the shoot on that. But, yeah, if, if you want to donate, uh, we're raising money for a good cause for uh, Pride initiatives in, in the greater Toronto area. So hit up sdpn.ca slash pride or just click the link in the description of this podcast right now and you can find all the info on how to donate and how to get involved in our virtual 5K. Cool. Let's talk about Spanish Grand Prix. Max Verstappen dominates the whole thing. Red Bull dominance uh, as usual. Um Jesse, let's start, start this off. I mean, I had this conversation uh, with TSN earlier today. Can Red Bull win every race this season? Like, there's a real strong possibility. <laughs> like, we're, we're, not, we're not at the Mercedes conversation yet, so hold that. But they looked great. <laughs> they looked like the second-place team, which was good to see as a Mercedes fan. But it looks like right now they have the best car, and it's the best car by dozens of seconds you know it's it's no race is close and even if max starts at the back he's gonna find his way to the top so i think there's a good chance here they could do the impossible and win every single race especially if checo you know cleans that up a little and can be as competitive as max is every single week in and out but the only thing right now that'll stop them is safety cars uh, red flags, rain, anything outside of the drivability of the car is the only thing that's going to stop Red Bull. Crazy thing is, is that no F1 team has you know ever won every race. I mean, McLaren got close in 1988. I believe my math is correct. They won 15 out of the 16 races and it was senna he got caught up with a if i remember correctly he got because i was a kid he got caught up with a back marker i believe it was a williams um with a few laps to go uh during the italian grand prix and that's how they didn't win every single race that season so mm -hmm. i mean it just shows you that things at the front of the the grid are can be fragile i mean today for instance if you know, Max uh, has something go wrong. Lewis just goes right through and captures the win. Yeah. So I think as we look at this thing, I, I don't think they're going to be able to do that because, you know, I look at upgrades. What are teams bringing? How close is this? Uh, the deltas, lap time deltas, how are they going to shrink? And so that's the kind of way I, I, I do look at it. But I mean, Verstappen's not getting much help from his teammate lately. Uh, I mean, Jesse Sergio has been struggling, man. Yeah. Uh, Nico Rosberg tried to ask Christian Horner the question about, hey, did you think that Perez could have had a better first half of the race? And Christian Horner just shut him down completely. So I'll ask you that question because we didn't get an answer out of him. Do you think Checo could have had a better race? He's in a, he's in the best the sec, the best car, you know? I mean, here's the thing. Like, oh, God. Sergio had a... I'll start at the beginning. I mean, Sergio... Mm -hmm. had a difficult weekend in Australia and he bounced back a bit in Miami but then he got smashed by Max during the race in Miami then in Monaco it was a disaster absolute disaster mm -hmm. and this weekend he was just well off the 
well off the pace. And I think I think this has been a huge hit to his confidence. And I don't see him coming back from this. Like I in terms of like taking the fight back to Max and cuz we were talking about Sergio potentially being in contention to lead this championship at one point was uber close and we were saying like hey does this guy have a shot at winning this thing and so many people are like no it looks like a lot of those people are correct because yeah he was terrible on sunday jesse he was terrible mm-hmm. like, yeah that, that, he should have finished p2 have... he should have been p2 right when you have that car there aren't many excuses yeah. Yeah, every race he needs to be up there with max if, he, if he's not beating max like he needs to be number two and and when he's not it goes back to he struggled in qualifying and that set him back in the race and then he's trying to work his way through the pack and he's not as good as doing that as max is and he struggled in in those respects so it is definitely disappointing for him who he looked like he could actually challenge for the championship and as the season goes along and as more teams catch up he's only gonna fall further behind yeah and it's like you know where I'm not going to say, like, do they start thinking about Daniel Ricardo? Because I, I honestly don't see Sergio getting replaced at all this season. Uh, Ricardo, though, however, will um, take part in a Pirelli tire test with the RB19 following the British Grand Prix. That being said, I, I still don't see, you know, anyone replacing Sergio Perez. I don't see them taking him out of that car. I think he's probably in there for the rest of the season. So maybe this lifts a little bit of pressure off his shoulders now. I mean, who knows? But it's tough when your teammate is Max Verstappen. He's probably one of the best, you know, Formula One drivers in our generation, so to speak, outside of Lewis Hamilton. Max Verstappen's kind of getting there. He's at the peak of his powers right now. I mean, during the race, getting the black and white flag for track limits three times, even though he's got like almost a 30 second, you know, lead and his engineer having to, you know, pull pull him in, rein him in a bit. I mean, it's, yeah. it's Max and the guy's an animal. So it's uh, it's got to be tough to be that guy's teammate right now. Um, let's talk about Mercedes because Lewis Hamilton mm-hmm. had one hell of a race and sort of George Russell coming from where he came from P12 on the grid to finish P3. Uh, so they brought the upgrades to Monaco and then it was an up and down day for himself and also George on Friday. And then Lewis had a great quality on, on Saturday where George really struggled. I think George just took a different direction in terms of setup, but it was a terrific race by both on Sunday. Uh, I know Jesse, like, you know, you got to be happy to see this, right? Like, you're happy to see this, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. On, on Saturday, uh, for for a moment there in Q1 and Q2, Lewis was right there. He, he was he was he was in first place uh, coming out of Q2, I believe. And I was like, "There's a chance here." You know, he he gets second, yeah, right behind Max, and then he finishes uh, fifth. And I'm like, "Okay, maybe the car's not as good as I thought because George is struggling, and he only ends up fifth on the grid. So I don't know if the upgrades are, are actually going to work." And then they go to the race. And they're zipping out there. Like, immediately, right away, George hops up five places, even though he goes off the track a little. He's forced there. He had to do it. And he, he's right in the race. And and then Lewis is going through the, the grid, passing all the Ferrari a couple of times. Uh, the Aston Martins couldn't challenge the Mercedes. And, and both of them are just in this race. And you're like, okay, there's some hope here. Maybe they can take a look at the the floor that uh, Sergio Perez exposed during Monaco and they mm-hmm. can take some more <laughs> ideas from that to even improve the car. But you're like, the Mercedes is coming back. It looks, it's the fastest car, in the, the second fastest car on the grid now, uh, which is essentially first place because Red Bull's so yeah. far ahead and they're <laughs> second in constructors. So there's a chance that Lewis can catch up in points to Alonso, finish second in the drivers and the cars looked great. And yeah. It looks like they'll be able to keep it up for the rest of the season just because that's one of the big upgrades. And I believe there's two more instances of big upgrades, but they're already so far ahead of the rest of the pack now that things are looking good. Yeah, I think like one of the things with this, with the big upgrade that they've kind of brought here. I mean, I, when I first saw it in Monaco, I thought it was kind of a bit of a Frankenstein car and I wasn't too sure how it was going to work. 
simply because how they it had, had the, side pods. Well, the thing is, is that like the way that yeah, so true it did. I think like, the, but the way they integrated everything with the side impact structure, and mm-hmm. they kind of had to develop so much around that. Where a lot of the other teams, they decided to um, integrate their their side impact structure into the actual tub where. Mercedes is kind of protrudes from the top and that mm-hmm. aerodynamically it ruins a lot of things for them but at the end of the day I mean their race pace was extremely strong on on Sunday and for them they haven't had a great like race car for for quite some time now since these regulations came in it was a little hot and cold at some moments but this weekend it was kind of it was it was a little more consistent and yeah. it was nice to, nice to see because they put they put a ton of work in. They've put a ton of work in in getting these new upgrades coming and like you said Jesse they got more stuff in the pipeline that's going to be coming down coming down here soon. Um which brings us to Lewis Hamilton. Contract situation. He's out of contract at the end of this season. So post race during the FIA press conference, he was asked about his contract situation. And he had said that he hasn't signed anything yet with Mercedes, but he's meeting with team boss Total Wolf on Monday and, quote, said, hopefully we can get something done. Now, Total Wolf also was saying post-race that the two just need to, to get some time to sit over, have a coffee, and that'll take... A half an hour. I'm sure it's going to take a lot longer than a half an hour to get a contract right. like this sorted <laughs> out. But regardless of all that, it sounds like we could have um, some Hamilton contract uh, talks imminent in the next few weeks here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with with all the rumors about Lewis's contract, it's like, where else is there for him to go? He's not going to be a Red Bull driver. Ferrari, like, they're they're not reliable enough for him to sign up for that. Aston Martin, I don't think that's a chance. So, like, there's no place else on the grid right now, currently as it is, for him to go. So it's always been, it's going to be Mercedes because they're going to do everything they can to get him that next World's Drivers' Championship so that he can finally get it and retire, you know? And they're going to have that same vision with him. They're going to be aligned in their in their goals for the next few years. So it only makes sense for him to just stick around. It also sounds like from the team that, you know, they, they may be able to claw into a lot of Red Bull's advantage as this season sort of progresses. Now I'm not I'm not saying that that's gonna be done like at the Canadian Grand Prix, but I think as we get into the later half of this season, past the summer break, I think we may see like Mercedes start pushing Red Bull a lot more for for wins, um, which would be nice to see. Another team that we also might see do that later in the season is Aston Martin with Lance Stroll finishing P6 and Fernando Alonso P7. Good bounce back from Lance this weekend. It's been tough for him over the past few races. Uh, Alonso had a rough one for sure. I think the car just yeah. car just not car just not fast enough on, on Sunday. You know, from free practice one, you know, the team was on a a different setup from, you know, what they had originally predicted. So the team, you know, had to do a lot of work to get this car to perform. And that takes a lot Mm -hmm. of time and it takes away from a lot of your qualifying pace and looking to see how your quality pace and your race pace match up. So usually with this team this season, Jesse, they've rolled off the truck well in FP1. And I think this is the first time this season I've seen them just just really struggle uh, to open it up uh, open up the weekend. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of hype going into this weekend thinking that Alonso's going to get that next win. Like there was a real push uh, behind like the media and the fans thinking that this could be the weekend for them to sneak in and get a victory, but it seems like the the car is faster on street courses. I don't know if there's there's evidence to point to that, but it seems like throughout uh, the season we've gone so far, the Aston Martins excelled at the street courses and these more traditional racetracks. By the way, I'm a huge fan of the track in Barcelona. Yeah. Like this is one of my 
favorite races every year just because how traditional the racetrack is yeah. like it reminds me silverstone along the same lines like i love these kind of races and the yeah, aston martin just doesn't seem to excel in these in these types of tracks and and when we saw the mercedes you know there's that little hiccup where uh the red bull when max was there and he didn't really like his hard tires and you're like okay is there a chance where mercedes could sneak in here <laughs> and just outrace them for real quick if his tires start slipping and there's no real uh there's no real threat from the aston martin at any point you know like we never saw alonso be up in that little battle there and just the entire race he kind of just trailed back and he ends up finishing seventh and they never really challenged there yeah they they need some bigger upgrades for this car i think Mm -hmm. you know one of the things that's hold them held them back so far this weekend was that i mean if we take a look at some of the other teams who have brought big upgrades lately i mean we're starting to see what alpine finally has because they've unleashed a fairly aggressive um upgrade package for their car and they've gained back a ton of performance alpine has and actually that's one of the teams that they were worried about uh coming into this weekend and you know fernando even talking to the media about wanting aston martin to try and get more upgrades to this car sooner the car was slow on the soft tire and it was slow on the hard compounds and that's both what lance and alonso uh, ran in Sunday's race and I mean it'll be interesting to see what they bring to Canada if they bring anything at, at all but the thing is is that this car really hasn't been touched Jesse all season so far and they're still performing reasonably well but I would have expected them to have something sooner on this car so it'll be interesting to see what happens in um in Canada what did you think of uh Alonso and Stroll not battling for P6 I I thought it was interesting because Alonso's ahead of him in the drivers championship so you'd think like he'd want the points you know yeah. he'd he'd want to keep those points to push ahead but you understand like not wanting to challenge your teammate so that no mistakes happen you can maintain that 6 and 7 but even if Alonso goes ahead of him you still get the 6 and 7 so it's a curious decision. I don't know what the motive. I I don't know what the motivation is behind that. If it's head games or just trying to show some favor to your teammates, so that in the long run you guys have less of a competition and you're more on the same page. Like you do something nice here, so that I get something nice down the road. You know, that's what it kind of felt like because it made more sense for Alonso just to pass him and just have six seven the other way. I think it was a good idea to like make sure that they didn't race each other. I mean, mm-hmm. you're racing for P6, yes. You know, I think also people need to remember that this is a battle for the constructor's points and the constructor's standings mm-hmm. for Aston Martin. They're not winning the driver's title here. Let's be honest. Like every, we all know that. We, <laughs> you know, we know. We saw Max today. He was incredible. Was, <laughs> they're, just, they're not winning the driver's title this season. But that being said, they can still place very high in the constructor standings and i think for for them being in p2 for as long as they were before being bumped down to p3 i think they want to stay within that that uh that medium because of the prize money that they're going to get yes they're going to get a reduction in wind tunnel and cfd design but at the end of the day they're still going to get money which is what we why why they go out and race a lot of the times jesse Uh, so i thought it was a good idea to 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 keep them separate to to make sure that they weren't racing each other i mean you couldn't you couldn't have them race each other crash into each other lose all those points and then rock up into canada and have everybody be happy and excited they're at the canadian grand prix you know Mm -hmm. yeah that that would have been the entire story (laughs) yeah if that had happened it was a very mature decision by alonzo (laughs) For sure. Well, the team feels pretty confident uh, heading to Canada. So, again, I'll be interested to see what, if anything, they bring. I mean, Alonso thinks that they will be able to fight with the Red Bulls soon. So, whatever upgrade they decide to, to bring, I, I hope it um, gives them quite a bit of performance back. Uh, we'll talk about Ferrari. It's been a disaster for them. Uh, Science P5, Leclerc. P11, Jesse, your thoughts on Ferrari. What a weekend, man. Oh, my God. Disaster. Oh disaster. God. Every every couple races, we get one of these races out of Ferrari where it's man. not even just, like, 
the the car issues or the driver it's everything you know the, from the strategy onwards from from qualifying like Leclerc was never in it and and uh we saw an um a mistake I think it was when he was going from the hards to the softs and and he goes to the pit and he's like let's go onto the softs and they put him onto the hards anyways even though he was no fan of the hards and there's just there's been so many mistakes at Ferrari, and we thought the changes that they made in management this off season would fix a lot of that. And it seems like it goes deeper than than even who was who was around last season. Yeah. It's it's rooted in the team right now, and that they can't have a clean weekend where everything kind of works. You know, it's either the car is not going right, or the strategy is not there, or it's not cooperating with the tires. And I don't know where Ferrari goes from here because they're they look like a mess. For those who don't know, Ferrari brought a sizable upgrade to the car for this weekend. Just a bit of backstory on that. Uh, heard from Frederick Vasseur during the Monaco Grand Prix. It mentioned that they weren't going to be bringing any big upgrades to the car and were actually going to introduce smaller upgrades throughout the race races. So when they show up to the track in Spain and it looks like the entire aero philosophy on that race car has changed, that's a huge upgrade. That is a change of direction for this team where in the past they ran these massive side pods with these huge bathtub-like fixtures running down the middle. Now everything's a little bit narrower. They have more of a gully, more of downwash, trying to get more air to the rear diffuser. And, you know, it's going to take some time for them to see if this thing worked or or didn't work. That's That's the one thing we need to watch out for. The other part of this is the quality pace. So they made a step forward, for sure, with this new upgrade. The problem is it's just far too inconsistent from stint to stint, like you were saying with the different types of tires that they're rotating through. So compound to compound, it's just too fragile. The car is just too, yeah, it's too inconsistent at the moment. So I'm holding out judgment on these upgrades as I, as I feel it's the right direction for them as a team because if we look at everybody's converging as to the Red Bull or something similar to what Aston Martin is starting to do as well. So there is there is convergence starting to happen, and I think that's a good thing because it's going to claw... People are going to be able to claw back performance way faster now. But the other part of this is Charles Leclerc and Charles Leclerc's confidence because Jesse was mm -hmm. an absolute nightmare for him this weekend. Yeah, he doesn't seem happy with the team at all, you know, just, just right away from qualifying, you know, when you when you can't when you can't get out of uh, what was it? Q, Q1, the yeah. Q2, he can't get out yeah, of, Q1. you know, in and then you go into the weekend and you're just stuck at the back of the pack and you're you're watching a guy like Perez in, in a in a great car, you know, weave his way through. And you, that's yeah. what you expect out of the Ferrari car as well. And he can't get out of the back of the pack and. I don't know what his future is with Ferrari because, like with Lewis, there's not really other places to go, but he can't be happy with the direction of the team. It's tough for a driver when you have setbacks like this. I mean, looking at qualifying, Leclerc was dumbfounded as to what was wrong with the car. They couldn't figure out what was what was wrong with it. He had no confidence with the rear end of the car, and that's why he ended up where he ended up with Q1. And then I get a text in the middle of the night with Ferrari changing their entire rear end of the car for Sunday's race. And they've changed some PU, PU elements as well. I just think for, for Charles Leclerc, like you said, you can't look elsewhere, but you have to make sure that you're your your confidence isn't being you know ruined because it's yeah. it, as a driver it's it's very fragile and if you if you start getting bad results or you don't understand why things are happening that ruins your trust within not the team but it ruins your trust within the car and that spirals in a downward downward spiral and so he's in a tough spot carlos Sainz is clearly outperforming him at the moment um Actually, I would say this year, he, Carlos Sainz has been great. I mean, considering the equipment that he's been driving, like, Carlos Sainz has done a really great job. The potential 
I think is 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 there for this car. They they were faster than the Aston Martins, so they they did make a step with this this upgrade. But yeah, Jesse, I mean it's like it's like other sports, right? Like you follow and you report on and you go through hockey so much that you know you know what happens to a player who loses their confidence or has their confidence yeah. shattered. Yeah, yeah. No, like you see it in uh, baseball is one of the most obvious ones when it happens yeah. with a pitcher and they get the yips, you know, and they can't throw a ball over the plate. Like that's that's one of the most clear examples in sports of when a guy just – when you're not feeling it and it's gone, you lose the confidence, it's, it's not there and you can't get it back. And we see Carlos Sainz in the same machinery, you know, and he's able to figure it out. He's able to be the – third fastest car after the Red Bull and the Mercedes then it was the Ferrari and and Leclerc just all weekend it was never there and the frustration it's he's not able to hide it at all you know if, if you listen to if you listen to the Ferrari radio there throughout that race there was like a, a 20 lap stretch where he's just not saying anything yeah. and the silence is so loud because He's he's in silence. He's out of frustration. You know, he's frustrated, so he's silent. He's not communicating with the team. He's not giving them feedback on what's happening because he's just struggling out there, unable to control the car at all. And I hope that he gets used to it here as as he learns the new the new cars and all the upgrades that they've brought, just for the sake of of Ferrari and for him as a driver because he's a great driver. Like we've seen what Leclerc can do when things are working for him and. There's often mistakes. We saw that a bunch last year. But when he's on, he's one of the best. Man, I just want to see Ferrari do well for once. <laughs> for, <laughs> that's all a guy can ask for these days, let me tell you. Alpha Tauri and Alpha yeah. Romeo, there was a good battle between uh, Yuki Tsunoda and uh, Zhou Guan Yu uh, during the end, mm -hmm. towards the end of this r race. Um, obviously, uh, Yuki ended up getting a five-second uh, time penalty. Um Yuki felt that uh, the Joe had uh, pretended, air quotation marks, pretended to run wide during their battle down into uh, T1 on Sunday. Uh, Jesse, what did you make of that? <laughs> you think he pretended to I like, don't know. Okay, here comes Yuki. I'm going to try it. No, I'm gone. <laughs> no, no. I don't believe that at all. I think the, the penalty was deserved. But I think Yuki is coming to his own yeah. as a driver. You know, yeah. we're starting to see him get some confidence. You know, yeah. we're, we're just talking about confidence with Leclerc. Like, yeah. Yuki this season feels like a better driver. He yeah. feels like he's understanding what it takes to drive in F1 now. And we're seeing him get up into the points territory more often. He's in these battles more often. And I like this season what I've seen out of Yuki. He feels yeah. he feels more confident out there. Yeah, 100% agree. He drove his ass off today and... Uh... Has done a great job this season. Same with uh, Zhou Guan Yu. He's been really great this season, too. He's been great for Alfa Romeo, sometimes saving their bacon on some of these races, man. Let me tell you, getting some points mm -hmm. for them um, as well. I mean, I think he's at some point, out, uh, some points this season, he's outperformed the car. Uh, and I think this weekend may have been one of those weekends. Uh, Alpine. Um, Ocon finishing P8. Then you had Gasly, P10. Alpine... Yeah. has really started to, to to come into their form here, Jesse. I mean, like, we saw something similar from them last season where they kind of started a little further back, but then they really started to get aggressive with those upgrades and claw claw back all this performance. Should, uh, should the likes of, like, Ferrari and Aston Martin and Mercedes be worried about Alpine? Yeah, I, I don't know if, if now's the time to worry. Like, maybe later in the season we see a couple more upgrades and maybe even next year, you know, they, they build on the mo momentum they had. But I was I was disappointed because I want to see what Gasly could have done if he was started up higher in the grid. Because mm. I thought, like, where where he started, it was, it was great, and what he did during the waves was fantastic. But imagine if he had started, like, P3 or, or P4, P4 yeah. you know? And, and everything he could have done from that position, because the car looked fantastic. And I think Gasly in particular had a really good race. And yeah. if, he had, if he was up there amongst the, the leaders of the pack, like, I think he could have made some damage and like, snuck into one of those top positions. Yeah, obviously Gasly qualifying uh, P4, but then got slapped with the, uh, the, three, the two, two grid penalties. Both were worth three yeah. positions each, which put him back to starting P10, and that was for impeding Max Verstappen during qualifying and Carlos Sainz as well. Uh, Esteban Ocon had a pretty 
interesting moment with his former teammate Fernando Alonso and it was a little <laughs> oh, yeah. like it was a like look like I, I'm a fan of hard racing like yeah. I was brought up on hard racing man like that's what you did when you race like I raced hard and like I'm a fan of it but like this one was a little out of left field now I, I don't have anything against it uh, I, I really don't but well he did take him out he did take him to pit out man like that's it, it was <laughs> It was a little much. Like, I, I like okay, I, I get you're defending, but that's not how you defend an F1. Like, I feel like there's a common courtesy between these drivers where we don't see this in F1. You know, we don't see these these late uh, defense tactics where or double defense tactics, whichever way you want to look at it, where you're just getting right in front of the the guy behind you. Like, I, it was a it was a little dangerous, and I'm glad like nothing came of it because Alonso was was real good on the wheel there. Yeah. But yeah. I think it was uh, it was unnecessary. Uh, again, like I, I don't have anything against it. I just found that it was a mm-hmm. it was a little out of nowhere, a little odd, considering he didn't really yeah. race anyone else that hard. Uh, but look, again, no, and- I got no problem with it. The Aston Martin was faster than him, anyways. Yeah. Like, once he once yeah. he passed him, he was two seconds ahead of him by the end of the lap. So there was no need for all of that defense. That's just a little, you know. Hello there from Ocon. You know, <laughs> missed you, buddy. Right. Yeah. Uh, talk about right. uh, we'll talk about Adam Wilde's uh, favorite team here, McLaren. Uh, oh, Oscar Piastri yeah, no. and Lando Norris. Piastri finishing P13, Norris P17. Norris, however, starting P3. Um, how sad do you think Adam's going to be? Oh, he is, he's he's in tears right now. I assume he's watching the <laughs> because he couldn't watch it live, so I assume he's watching it tonight. But uh, just what a disappointment. You know, you, 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 you get up into qualifying, you know, you're P3, and then right away you collide into the back of Lewis, and uh, that's your race. You know, the McLaren doesn't have the car, unfortunately, to, to get back into it after that. So just from lap one onwards, just disappointment for Lando. Yeah, and it's tough too, right? I mean, with, with that, they, they didn't even feel they were going to be able to even, like, hold on to even a, a, a top top five and maybe just scoot into the top ten. Uh, with their car, I think they got lucky with the the right temperature conditions for their car. It wasn't too hot this weekend in Spain, and I think that helped actually quite a few teams with the qualifying this weekend. And mm-hmm. McLaren in particular definitely helped them as as well. But Norris also put together a really good lap. He couldn't believe it on the radio that uh, he had held on to P three <laughs> at the end. Yeah. But uh, uh, obviously they've already gotten a big upgrade. Uh, for their car, they have another big upgrade coming uh, for either Austria or Hungary. Let's go over to Twitter, and we'll take your questions uh, from there. From John R., in your opinion, if Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen were driving the same car, in quota- uh, in brackets, let's just say the current Red Bull because it's the fastest do you think Lewis would be winning fifty percent of the races, Jesse? <laughs> that's a that's a very interesting question. I guess it'd be it'd be like what we saw in twenty twenty, right? We'd see a split down the middle where they end up a couple points uh, yeah. within each other, you know. And it'd come down to if they're in the same car, a lot of it would come down to things like safety cars and, and accidents and and those those kinds of mistakes. Because I I believe like. They're two of the best drivers we're going to ever see in our lifetimes, right? So yeah. whatever, if they're in the exact same vehicle, the times are going to be very similar. You know, yeah. they're not going to outdrive each other that much. I, w- I would love to see it. I would, mm-hmm. that would be great. That would be, you would be on your couch every weekend watching that battle. And yeah. I'm excited to see where Mercedes can go with these upgrades because... You know, I think we may get back to those days, you know, in the not too distant future. From uh, Rye missed the apex, <laughs> right on. Another tough weekend for Lando Norris. Do you see him sticking with McLaren after 2024, recognizing his current contract technically goes through to 2025? Jesse, what do you think? Oh, that's interesting. Like, I feel like Lando's been a great soldier for McLaren. I feel like yeah. they really like him. Yeah. And uh, 
and he's he's done well so far, but they're gonna need results. Like they they sided with Lando over like they got rid of Daniel and and Lando's the one who's there. I don't really see him going anywhere. You know, I feel like he's he's their driver, but mm-hmm. you would be more knowledgeable on that contract situation if they're or they are thinking about uh, moving on from him. I I think like if he goes anywhere, I I have a feeling it would be to like Audi. So when Audi comes mm-hmm. online and in, in 2026, why not head on over at the end of uh, 2025? You know, do a deal with Audi. I'm mm-hmm. sure they would probably love to have a talent like Lando Norris on their team. Um, that's kind of what I see. I, I would, yeah, I, I would put money on that one actually because I don't necessarily <laughs> see him going anywhere else, either McLaren or, if not McLaren, then he, yeah, he moves over to Audi. From uh, Chris in the six, why is Pato Award snake bitten? Uh, snake bitten. I don't see. I don't really understand what that means, but like, I'm assuming bad luck, but. Yeah. He, he's talking about uh, so today in the IndyCar race, which we're going to do a separate pod on on Tuesday uh, with Tom Gaymore from um, Sky Sports. Um, but anyways, so in the race today, Pato pitted and they didn't lock up this front, the front or sorry, the rear, the rear left tire. So the rear left tire started to come off as he's leaving pit out. He has to stop. He was in a good position to score a podium at that point, though. So they wheel him back, fix the tire, fire him back up, send him out. And he's doing everything he can, Jesse, in this race, not to go a lap down to Alex Pillow. And I think it was San- Santino Ferrucci. He tried to send one down the inside of him into the one of the final turns. And he just clouts the wall, destroys the car, ends his weekend. Oh, wow. Not one of the smartest moves from Pato because, like, he's in a championship <laughs> battle at the, at the moment. So it's kind of right. like, dude, just... You know, take the L, go the lap down. You're going to collect the points. Just do it. And you might be able to get back on the lead lap, which we saw turned into utter chaos towards the end of the IndyCar race. I love IndyCar, Jesse. I mean, the race was absolutely awesome uh, this weekend. Yeah. And I, 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 you probably didn't have time to watch it, but it was absolutely incredible. I encourage everyone to try and find a re-air of it and uh, check it out. It was pretty awesome. Uh, what else have I got on the docket for us here? Ah, uh, I actually want to talk to, to you a bit about the the F1 season so far, but, you know, this race uh, was a, actually it was a little more exciting than we've seen in the previous mm-hmm. races so far th- this season. I don't want to say anything is boring, but I what I'm saying is, is that I see the entertainment value from like Lewis Hamilton down to the back of the grid was very entertaining this weekend. And I've actually have never seen a field in Formula One that close. I mean, remove Red Bull altogether, just remove them. I've never seen a grid that close. And I kind of, I kind, I'm just hoping that the teams really start to eat into that Red Bull gap because I think we get a good, clear picture of what these regulations could actually really look like. What do you think? Yeah, no, qualifying really gave me hope for yeah. the rest of this season because qualifying was insane. That was yeah. one of my favorite qualifying sessions of the entire season. Like we saw, I think it was six different teams in the top seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was insane to see just the battle back and forth and, and just each each session we had a different leader and... I thought that gave a lot of hope for where the season go. And then you get to the race and there's a lot of passing. Like I was very encouraged by how close they could, they could get to each car and, and that there are a couple different passing points on this track. And if, if we get away from like Red Bull running away with the whole thing and we see everybody kind of bunch up together, I feel like there's a lot of hope for the rest of this F1 season and not necessarily like chasing down Max and in, in mm-hmm. the drivers or chasing down Red Bull and the constructors, but just more races like we saw today where the entire pack is in it and mm-hmm. from from two onwards, who knows where anybody's going to finish in that. We saw some great battles that like 10 and, and 13 and it was it was a really good race today and I, we haven't seen this so far and yeah. hopefully this is what we're going to see moving forward. Yeah, me too, because this is more, like you said, you know, it's more more traditional type of racetrack, so mm-hmm. it's you can get a better understanding where the entire field kind of sits. And I think at one point in, I think it was free practice two, there was separated by like one and a half seconds from first place all the way down to, to 20th. So 
that's an encouraging sign where in the past, I mean, it used to be, it would sometimes be like three, maybe even four seconds with some teams. Like, it was bad. Mm-hmm. So, like, this is good. It's a good sign. I just, uh, you've got this massive audience, like, locked in, right? And you've got a lot of new yeah. fans. And you don't want to, like, lose those fans, you know, Jesse? So, it's, that, yeah. that I, I worry no, about this that. this is a... It's a very important era in F1 because yeah. they gained so many fans over the last two years. And this season, it didn't start off well in terms of keeping those fans. You know, mm-hmm. we have a couple canceled races. There was a long break in between. And then we have a race like Monaco where there's not a lot. We had uh, a, an entire race that took place in the rain where nothing really <laughs> happened, you know. And those things, like, you're trying to maintain this new fan base because it is an entertainment product at the end of the day. And you need these fans to stay engaged and one thing you love indycar and right. indycar has completely different regulations and they and they handle the car differently and even things like drs the way they do the push to pass kind of thing and are there specific things you would steal from indycar and implement into f1 if you were the czar of f1 and could to mix those rules like great- immediately that you think would that you think would change the f1 races yeah great question i think I think like the push to pass, I would definitely take. I would definitely take that because you can use it whenever you want. You don't have to be within a second of somebody. If you're four seconds back and the lead car's coming into pit, you could uh, potentially overcut them if you use enough of the push mm-hmm. to pass and then maybe steal first place away. So it's like there's so many different options you can use with that. On the second, a second point of this is that I think they. They need to cool it with the regulation changes. Like they need, they need to cool it. Like just stop. Like you've got to set right now. You have to let everybody catch up. And, but the problem is, is that it takes like years to catch up. It's not something that gets done like immediately. So with the new round of regulations coming in for 2026, it's kind of like, well, holy hell! Like you just, you just had a like a regulation change. And now you got a team that's blowing the doors off of everybody, and it's like you got to make sure that you're keeping things contained. So if you look at 2021, and they did have a small little regulation change with the rear floor of the car, if I remember correctly, in 2021, but for the most part, everybody was running the same type of car that they ran in 2020, only with a few upgraded parts on it. But you saw the convergence happening, and we got great racing. And that's the thing. It's like you let this... And you you change the regulation too many times too soon, you just keep getting this dominance. And I think you got to let the regulations settle in. I really do. I think you got to let them settle in. I think 2026, you just do the en- engine regulation. You just leave the car regulation alone. That's what I think. Okay. Yeah, because because once if you keep changing, one or two teams might figure it out, yeah. and then the, you get the Red Bull instance. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. And if they can if they can just stick with this and have it for a long while, we'll see different teams catch up and different teams fall back. And yeah, it'll be interesting in twenty twenty six when we get the new teams coming in. Uh, if it's just Audi, I know they had the application deadline uh, fairly recently for new teams, mm-hmm. and we're gonna get an announcement that during the summer. And mm-hmm. I hope like. It stabilizes for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's the thing, right? You just got to make sure you rein it in on these regulations with the cars, man. Like, you got to keep it yeah. locked in so teams can kind of catch up. Uh, Canadian Grand Prix is yeah. coming up in a few weeks' time here. We're going to have quite a bit of stuff coming out on Nailing the Apex. Uh, like I said, with Tuesday with IndyCar uh, commentator uh, Tom Gamor from Sky Sports. And then Thursday, we've got Gunther Steiner. <laughs> so that's incredible <laughs> that is that's the official announcement like you haven't revealed that yet right this that's is it right this there, is the buddy. moment you're revealing that that's it oh my gosh wow <laughs> that's the that's the biggest guest in like sgpn history <laughs> gunther yeah. steiner is gonna be on this this podcast yeah man it's gonna be fun i'm looking forward to i'm looking forward to talk to gunther again it's been a it's been a couple weeks since i talked to him last because i was bugging him in miami but no i'm looking forward to this it's gonna be a lot of fun uh yeah we're gonna be doing a lot of fun stuff here so keep it locked in nailing the apex uh jesse let everybody know where they can get you on social media and let them know what you got going on oh follow 
at SDPN Sports. I'm not going to plug myself. I'm going to plug the network. I know you're listening to this pod, which is on the network, but follow at, at SDPN Sports for all of your other sporting needs. We're on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash SDPN if you're not watching this podcast there right now, if you're just listening. And make sure you follow Tim. Tim does a great job with this show, and he deserves all of the follows in the entire world. Rate this podcast. I know he tells you every episode, but if you haven't done it, do it. Rate this podcast. Give it a follow on Apple and Spotify. Yeah, that's pretty much it. You did the sign-off. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you all later. (laughs) 